fire. Um, my name is Lisa Fager Badiaco. I'm with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. And um, before I start this awesome conversation, I'm so excited to have all these folks here today. I want to give you a little background about how we got here today. Let's see, I made a nice little PowerPoint for us to see. Voila, this is me. Okay. Um, I work with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, and we are funded through the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, and we're through an initiative called Act Against AIDS Leadership Initiative. And um, just to give you some facts, we're, we focus, of course, on HIV under this initiative, and um, you've probably all seen these stats before. Um, and they're very disturbing, since HIV is a preventable disease. Um, but you can read them. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the partners. In 2009, the uh, CDC had, well, actually 16 organizations come together first, or 14. Um, but now we have expanded to 19. And uh, we represent both black and Latino national civil rights and social justice organizations. And we have been given this money to integrate HIV education, action, knowledge, awareness into what we already do on a daily basis. And here are our partners, some of which are in the room. Black Women's Health Imperative in the room. Anyone else in the room? No? Okay. Moving on. Um, again, to date or to since 2012, um, here are some of the activities that we've been able to do as um, collectively, as ally. We've conducted more than uh, 1,800 uh, HIV-related activities, including briefings, trainings, workshops, and outreach events. We have also um, we've had more than almost uh, 1.4 million people attend our events. We have facilitated um, testing and had over 30,000 people tested. Over 400 chapters and affiliates of our organizations have participated in our efforts around the country. And we have generated, and this number is definitely bigger, but um, since last year we had um, generated 1.4 billion media impressions. The CBCF, um, to single them out, since that's why we're here today. Uh, we have conducted more than 60 HIV-related activities, including trainings and briefings on the Hill, as, long as, as well as workshops and outreach events. We have had more than 9,000 people attend our events. We've collaborated with more than 45 national, state, and local community-based organizations, health, de health departments, and hospitals. And we have facilitated testing for more than 1,500 people. Um, also to mention that we have free testing here today um, in the exhibit hall, so if you have not been tested, please get tested. And we have exposed 8.5 million people to HIV prevention messages through media. And we, of course, work with the Congressional Black Caucus, um, and we have, had, we have engaged them and partnered with them in uh, various activities, and here are some of our congressional members in action. And some of our extended discourse around HIV AIDS has centered around HIV criminalization. And here are some of our partners and things that we've done. We've hosted congressional briefings. We've worked with the United Nations um, to host a briefing and town hall meeting around HIV criminalization. We, I presented at the International AIDS Conference. We have also um, presented at the United States Conference on AIDS, hosted a telebriefing and also was featured in an article on theroot.com. We are also um, hosting HIV Stigma Conference. I uh, have been very much involved with that. Uh, Dr. Vargas, I think she was just in the room, but she is, um, her and Dr. Rana at Howard University have been very instrumental in this um, free stigma conference that happens every year. Please check it out. Um, this year it's November 22nd. We have had uh, more than 800 people um, come online to do the to uh, visit the conference from over 50 countries, as well as 500 people uh, in the room. They are also 
we're also helping them develop a stigma center at Howard University. And just to let you know, we're going to continue our work around this and we're really trying to normalize the conversation around HIV AIDS. Um, and that's really why we're here today, to try to have a conversation around sexual health, something that we don't talk about very often. Um, and still, what we're finding, you know, since doing this work in 2009, that after 30 years, people still do not know how HIV is transmitted. Uh, we encourage, again, everybody to get tested. Um, I think, you know, it's been very interesting to try to get people more, those who have not been involved in HIV, to get them involved in dis different aspects. So now, whether it be HIV stigma, criminalization, or discrimination, um, those those folks who have been, um, what's the word I want to use, less likely to get involved but see themselves more as experts around, say, criminalization or discrimination have come to the table to talk about HIV. And I think that this is a really good way to broaden our conversation and get those who have not been involved in HIV to now address it in our communities. And so today, is what is your sexual health IQ? And we hope to broaden this conversation because really HIV is just one little thing um, when you talk about sexual um, health IQ is a piece of that. And so hopefully we'll um, get into a really deeper discussion. And so, sorry. Okay. So, I want to introduce our moderator today, uh, June Cross. It's so funny, June. I was looking in my old business cards, and I found your card from WB, WGBH. Oh, my God. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my That's God. Like yeah, I was like... 10 a, years ago. Yeah. 12 years ago. I was like, uh, maybe longer than that, because I was like, I think I was a student when I met you. Wow. <laughs> a grad student then. I was five. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and um, so she was working in uh, Boston in a public television station, and I remember she did this awesome documentary called Secret Daughter, and so I've always been a fan. And then to find out that she was working on a documentary um, related to um, HIV in the South. You know, HIV or AIDS is the number one killer of black women in the South, the number one killer, but yet we don't hear about it. Um, and, and June is trying to make that happen so we can hear more. So um, there were bios on the, um, on the tables, so I hope you all received one, and they're also out front if you don't have one, we can get you one. But just to give you a little background on June, she, she started her career as an intern for a hometown paper, which I thought was so cute, um, the press of Atlantic City. But after she graduated from Harvard, she went to the Boston Globe, and when she got, um, she said, finding her true calling at Say Brother, the local black public affairs show that aired on WGBH in Boston, is which the card I have. And so she has been best well known, as I said before, for the documentary, uh, The Secret Daughter, which is an awesome documentary if you haven't seen it, and book. Um, so let's bring June up. She is I'm also... Up. I'm staying right here. Oh, oh, that's right. She doesn't want to get up. Um, so let me just tell you what she's doing now along with the documentary. She is a full professor at Columbia University um, Graduate School of Journalism. And so I want to welcome her and just thank her for, for being here today. Thank, thank you, you, Lisa. How sweet. Don't take that away. Come oh, oh, that's right, that's right. I need a bath. Oh, one more thing. Two things. Uh, I just want to, there's also a pamphlet um, that the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation has done that is important updates to um, the Affordable Care Act. So if you don't have one, please get one. And um, we have them out front so you can read up. These are very imperative since everybody needs to start rolling in October. Okay. All right. Um, okay, thanks. I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes because they all have, everybody here is like way more accomplished than me. <laughs> and I just want to take a second to introduce um, our distinguished panelists here. I mean, this, this conversation takes on great urgency, not only because of the, um, the sort of the beginning phase of the Affordable Care Act that starts in October, but also because the Ryan White Act, which has helped indigent people living with HIV, uh, also expires in October, so there's an extra special urgency about this conversation at this particular point in time. Um, I'm going to just sort of go straight down the line. Sitting right next to me uh, is a young brother who has been alive like 
barely 30 years and has already spent half of his life on the front lines dealing with um, teenagers, talking to teenagers, getting them engaged in safe sex practices and making them aware of their own sexual health IQ. Uh, I asked him at, um, while we were standing outside, how, does, how has he been doing this for 15 years and not uh, burnt out, and he says he crochets, he break dances, and he writes poetry. So, <laughs> yeah, that all works for me. You know, um, his name is uh, Dwayne Lawson Brown, and he works with Metro Teen Aids here in the District of Columbia. Um, those of you who are from D.C. are aware that the uh, the numbers of young people who are contracting not only HIV but HPV, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis. There, we've got epidemic proportions of this um, of these diseases going on. Uh, here in the District of Columbia. Um, next to Duane is uh, Dr. Bambi Gaddis. We all know as Dr. Bambi. Um, Dr. Bambi received her uh, bachelor's from Tuskegee, um, but then um, became a, uh, got interested in human sexuality and family life education, and she graduated from the University of South Carolina, where she received her PhD. She now runs uh, something called the South Carolina HIV AIDS Council. Um, she's a published author, and she consults with a host of national and local organizations, including the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, those of you who watch CNN's Heroes uh, may have seen her in 2009, featured as one of the CNN heroes. She, uh, at that time, was running the only mobile testing then in the entire state of South Carolina, which is a state that has no public transportation system to speak of. So if that van is not rolling around on the roads, um, people really have no access to testing. Um, next to Dr. Bambi is Reverend Lee, Reverend Tony Lee. Did she write that song for you? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, that song was not for me. All right. <laughs> uh, those of you who are in the audience who are of a certain age will know the song I'm referring to. Reverend Tony Lee is the uh, founder and senior pastor at the Community of Hope AME Church um, in Maryland. Uh, he holds a Master's of Divinity from Union Theological. When I was in New York, when I was reading about you, I saw that you do go-go. You have go-go. Yes, Yes, services yes, at your church. I need to come visit your church. <laughs> I need to come visit that church. Um, his church is known because as many churches in the United States have a hard time attracting young people, Reverend Lee's church has got young people all up in there. So we're all really interested in listening to how he not only engages youth in coming to the church, but engages them in community work at the church and, and also talking about issues that most of us don't even want to deal with in the church or think is not appropriate. And we're going to take on that whole question of what is and is not appropriate and where. Um, and last but not least is David. I should have asked you how to pronounce it. Is it Malbranch or Malabranch? You say Malabranch. Malabranch, okay. David Malabranch, I say that because he's a first-generation Haitian-American, and I asked somebody earlier, and they said Malabranch, and I said, oh, it looks like Malabranch. <laughs> okay, so uh, Dr. Malabranch is a, a clinician researcher who's been working and researching on um, the issue of uh, young men uh, living with HIV who are men having sex with men. Um, he's been at Emory University and told me he just needed to take a break from that work for a minute. Um, and so he's now at the University of Pennsylvania where he's doing more family practitioner, not family practitioner, but working more with young people, um, the college age adolescent group um, at UPenn because one thing this work does do is, is wear you out. But the other thing that he said that was great was he talked about being a mentor and mentoring um, the large numbers of young doctors now who are coming through and willing to talk about this issue and willing to take on and that's so important as we all move forward. So I want to talk. I want to start off just by talking about why it's so. What what are we talking about when we talk about a sexual um, sexual health IQ? Um, Dr. Bambi, can you lead us off? Hmm. Um, basically, uh, what we're uh, hoping to have a conversation around is how do how do how does one measure not just knowledge around this conversation of who are we as sexual people, but it's also about our attitudes and beliefs around the varying continuum of what occurs from the time that we're born till the day that we go to our graves, that we're ever evolving in this issue around sexuality. And you'll notice I didn't say sex, which is usually defined as an act, but what we're here to talk about is really about this evolution of who we are sexual people and all the myths and mytholo mythology 
um, and the misinformation that has been and continues, unfortunately, to uh, uh, distort uh, who we are and all the, not and, and the positive aspects uh, of sexuality, um, and to 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 really move toward a more positive conversation versus one that uh, unfortunately has been steeped in too much negativity. Why is it so important to have that conversation now? What's driving the urgency? I mean, a part of the conversation that we've had uh, throughout the week has to do with what is the outcomes of not, of not having this conversation. Um, I, I saw uh, a form that was distributed by the CDC talking about not just adolescent pregnancy, but looking at repeat pregnancies that are occurring. Um, uh, I know I work on uh, HBCUs, historic uh, black colleges throughout our state. Uh, and as you already noted, the, another outcome of the rates of HIV and STDs. Um, and so why is it, how is it that after 30 years of HIV, in this country? How is it that when we look at the epi data, we're continuously, as certainly as African American communities, overrepresented in so many of these um, health outcomes that are related to sexual decision making and sexual choices and exposure? Why are we still in the same place? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say in closure at this point that uh, the group just before us, they were uh, talking about prostate. Uh, cancer, and uh, I would get us guess to say that at least a quarter of the room was filled, um, and here we are, and there's less than that, and so there's a and and the gentleman that spoke spoke of the, asked the question why is this room not filled, where where are the men but certainly also where are the women, who who uh, support men who may be. Uh, Susceptible, so I think the conversation uh, has to continue, and we're putting out the same question. Dr. Malabranch, do you, how, what are the? How would you rate the sexual health IQ of the young people that you're coming into contact with at UPenn? Low. <laughs> <laughs> what is it they don't know? Um, I think a lot of people know enough about HIV, they hear about HIV, so they want to get HIV tested. What I'm seeing a lot of now is that people aren't really up to date on things like gonorrhea, chlamydia, uh, herpes, and warts. And uh, particularly when you look at like syphilis and herpes, how having those STIs can actually increase the risk of contracting HIV, or if you're HIV positive, increase the likelihood that you transmit anything to somebody else. Um, so back in May, I've been working for UPenn since November of last year, and uh, they brought me in as kind of a men's health and an LGBT health expert. And um, what we started doing back in May, because they were really reluctant to do anal pap smears, um, but I had worked in an HIV clinic for 11 years and had seen a lot of rectal cancer um, and a lot of anal HPV, so I was used to doing rectal pap smears. but. They weren't, they weren't, the staff there didn't think it was necessary to actually do that even with men who had a history of anal HPV, which is false. And then they also didn't think it was necessary to do uh, throat and rectal cultures for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, until I had to present them, I did a full scale PowerPoint presentation that had basically some studies that showed that if you just test people for urine for gonorrhea and chlamydia, the estimates is that you can miss about 84% of asymptomatic gonorrhea and chlamydia. Whereas if you test all three sites, mouth, anus, and the urine, and this is among men who have sex with men um, with asymptomatic, no symptoms at all, you reduce that chance of missing it to about 9%. And so what I started doing was really brain almost like brainwashing, plugging folks in and saying, look, you need to ask people what specific behaviors they're having, particularly with our MSM, and then culture accordingly. If someone is not having receptive anal sex, you probably don't need to do a rectal culture for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, but if they're having oral sex, and all the students that I see, when I ask them, none of them are using condoms with oral sex, but they may or may not use condoms with anal sex or vaginal sex. And so we've been doing a lot of cultures, and I've probably been averaging about one or two positive gonorrhea or chlamydia a week. And the person who does the epi, the nurse practitioner, she's been amazed. She was like, oh my God, I didn't, you're picking up so many other positive tests. And so we're treating people that came in and just said, oh, I just want to get a test. I, I just want to get screened. And then they come away with a diagnosis, which is unfortunate. Um, but I think at the end of the day, what we're finding, we're picking up a lot of these infections where people would say, oh, I have a discharge. But 
someone just gave me head and how could I get it from them giving me head? Well, this is how they can give it to you by giving you head. If they have asymptomatic gonorrhea, chlamydia, they just go down on you, all of a sudden you're gonna have a discharge. Um, so I, th I think when I see a lot of the youth today, um, there is kind of some misinformation and a lack of education about HIV, but they tend to be more up on the HIV than they do about HPV, the Gardasil vaccine, and herpes one and two, those kind of things they really seem to be clueless about. So I spend a lot of time at doing education in my sessions with them. Um, Dwayne, how do you open, how do you, you're talking to young people on the street. How do you begin having that conversation? Um, and is it easier with men than with women? Well, uh, in DC, it's, it's pretty, DC is pretty open. Um, very often, it's not me that's having those one-on-one -on -one conversations anymore. Now, we have a team of peer educators that are out in the streets, and so we, ha we put youth in front of youth and have them have the conversations. We train them so that they can know the stages of change and where, how to meet somebody where they are. Uh, so that they can then move forward, get them talking about condoms, get them talking about uh, testing, screening, um, being treated for STIs. Uh, we're seeing a lot of the same things that uh, you're seeing down there, David, um, with uh, folks who are catching STIs at an alarming rate and not realizing that the same thing that got you chlamydia is the same thing that can get you HIV. It's, it's the same action. Um, it's just a matter of were you exposed to HIV or not. Uh, and so that's, that's really where we are. Uh, we're trying to have the youth be the empowered ones. Uh, to have those conversations with their, their teammates, their classmates, and their peers. Mm -hmm. Do you find that it's easier for youth to talk about this stuff than their parents, get their parents to talk about it? Infinitely easier. Uh, parents, parents are incredibly nervous. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm a father, my five-year-old son, I'm nowhere near that stage yet, and I still worry. Um, and I've been doing this work for 15 years, and I still worry. Um, you mean you worry about worry having about to have the ha conversation? When I have to have the conversation with my son. Um, so imagining not necessarily knowing all the information yourself, then having to try to navigate everything that youth are coming in contact with daily. Uh, they're in school, but they're not necessarily spending their time on school things in school. Uh, they're at home, but they're not necessarily living and doing things at home. Uh, a lot of the time is spent on the internet, on TV, um, in video games, and you know we all know the messages that are there in those sorts of uh, media. So being a parent and trying to confront all of that becomes very difficult. Uh, so we are actually trying to build a parent peer-to-peer -peer program where we can have the parents trained and they can talk to other parents on how to talk to their children. So that when your child comes home from an HIV 101 at an organization, you're able to follow up the conversation accurately. Okay. Can I go yes. back a second? Um, because um, reflective of your five-year-old son, you, you're already talking to him. You may not, it may not be verbal. You know, we have this conception about the big talk where you sit him down and they're in a coma while you talk to them <laughs> and um, we're telling them what, we're telling them what will and will not happen in our house. Um, children watch. They look at whether you, how you walk around the house. They look at do you walk around, when you walk into, when they walk into your room, if you're dressed or not dressed, how you handle nudity in the house, things you say to them when you put them in the tub, uh, questions that you reflect off on and don't answer from what is this, why does she or he have that and I have this that you say, how we deflect or accept the question. So we're already both verbal and non-verbally communicating. Um, I grew up in a house where my father raised three girls with no mother present as of 10, 8, and 2. Um, now, in retrospect, I'm really clear the messages he gave. Uh, the messages were, I don't feel comfortable talking about women things, but I'm going to provide you with someone who will go to and gave me the names of the women that we could go talk to if we had questions about our womanly things. He said, if you have a question, go to the library. Every Saturday, we were required to go to the library. If you have some women things you want to talk about, go look it up in the library. But around nudity, 
three girls with a man in the house. That was our biggest lesson. He was more likely to tell us, go put house slippers on your feet than he was to say, um, I don't want to see you in your panties and bra coming from upstairs downstairs. That said volumes to us about how he interpreted that. And as I look at all three of us as now grown women, all of us have the same conversation. And the conversation is how blessed we were to grow up with a man in the house, just three girls, uh, never inappropriate touch, never, you know, coming at us in a way that, that the message around sexual, around nudity was what I'll call sex positive, mm -hmm. but it wasn't um, coercion. You know, it wasn't in a sex sexual way. It was just the way he allowed us to become, grow into our womanhood without making us paranoid. Mm -hmm. And and that has been a positive factor, but in, in, in certain marriages has also been quite interesting because if your partners in the future came up in a different setting, that impacts how they respond to your sexuality even in a relationship. Yeah, that's true. Reverend Lee, you have a a ministry in your church or several how did you did you initiate that did your parishioners initiate that can you talk about how you approach talking about sexual health within what most people think of as a as a off limit setting you're not supposed to go to church and talk about sex well, well a couple of things um, and and for us it started from the top down okay. um, for us um, and our church is a little different anyway we started our church in a nightclub um, and so our church started in a nightclub um, when we got our first kind of full time location or space mm -hmm. um, nine months later which was in a shopping mall um, we said that when we went in we weren't going to go in and just shout um, but on our first Sunday, we did testing during church service. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a need to shape a liturgical and theological environment um, in which um, we felt that um, worship was not just um, what you did on Sunday, but worship was how you took care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Worship was how you looked at your body, etc. cetera. Um, and so in that, say in the seven years, we tested over 3,500 people um, during church service. Um, and so it's kind of shaping that kind of environment. We trained um, church members to be able to kind of do some of the teaching, etc. We have a lot of the you know materials there. We have gone. We go. We have um, harm reduction materials also um, in some of the barber shops and beauty shops in the area. We have also done club tours in which we've done testing in the clubs in the area. Um, and so for us, it really has been about how to shape an environment in which uh, people saw that this kind of conversation um, was a part of a larger conversation um, and shaped larger theologically. Mm -hmm. What is that larger conversation? <coughs> Uh, yeah, what is that larger conversation? Uh, the, the larger conversation is um, that, in take, that in serving God, you also take care of your body. Um, that your health is important to God. Um, and so the scripture talk about your body is a living sacrifice. And so therefore, um, it's not just your service to God um, is, is how you're treating people, but your service to God is also how you take care of yourself. Mm. And is there a th you said there's a theological <coughs> basis to it as well? No, well, so that I, that, that's a piece of, part that's of a part of the theological. So okay. I said liturgical. Liturgical is in how you shape the worship experience. Okay. And so liturgical is the fact that um, people get tested during wor the worship experience. Our, our the, the way that our sanctuary is shaped um, is this big kind of open space. Um, it's about 30,000 square feet, but it goes straight back and to the side and it's open. And so what happens is during service, I get tested during service. Then we ask people to go and get tested. Um, we ask the leadership especially to go get tested um, because we shape an environment in which we say that you're going to get tested as a sign of leadership mm -hmm. um, so that people can feel comfortable going to get tested because it's just you showing leadership in the church. But people are getting tested while songs are being played. People are getting tested while the other piece of worship are being done. And so then they're able to get back for the sermon. And so then it's a part of the lead, it's a part of the whole worship experience. That's liturgical. So that says that getting tested, um, taking care of this stuff, condoms are handing out during testing, but, but that says that's a part of the worship experience. That's liturgical. Theological is a whole piece about um, that our bodies are living sacrifices. So that's how you shape it theologically. And so you approach it theologically to then shape it liturgically. I talked to so many pastors, um, a lot of them in the Bible Belt, who are just afraid to even bring this subject up. I mean, it, it's, it's moving. I see movement. Um, 
but there's so many pastors who feel that if they even begin to talk about sexuality or sex from their pulpits that they are going to, especially in the Baptist tradition, they'll lose their church. Um, have you engaged folks around that question? And uh, maybe uh, you could engage uh, this too. Well, I, know and I think there are a couple of pieces. Mm -hmm. One, that we do have to deal with um, and, and I shared this when we were talking on the phone call, um, but we do have to deal with some generational pieces. Um, that many of the passages you're talking about are baby boomers, mm -hmm. right? Boomers, a major value for boomers is Watch appropriateness, it. right? <laughs> <Watch>. <laughs> <laughs> right? Appropriateness is, is, what, is, appropriateness is, is what appropriateness. he said, okay. <laughs> right? If you look at boomers, appropriateness is important for boomers, and so that's why in church, <laughs> boomers won't deal with a lot of stuff. Is that another way of saying that young people have no shame? <laughs> well, and, and not to say young people have no shame. It, it, no, but if you look at it, say for Generation X, right. for us, it's the whole thing of authenticity. So if you listen to hip hop generation, it's about keeping it real. We keep it real. We keep it real. Now sometimes you can be lying saying you're keeping it real, but it's like we keep it real. We keep it real. For boomers, right, for, for a boomer, if a young person walks into the church with their hat on, it's like putting your fingers down a chalkboard. It drives them crazy, right? For Generation X, if a young person walks into church with their hat on, it's like, I'd rather have you in the church because we're just grateful to have you in the church. So what happens though is, so for boomers, appropriateness is that thing. They're upset about a hat. You gonna talk about condoms? Uh, you, you see what I'm saying? And, and, and so then, so there's a way that you have to enter into the conversation. The challenge is that many of the people um, who have been kind of pressing the conversation are pressing it in a way that they don't really understand pastors and they don't understand some of the generational dynamics. So they just think that pastors are ignorant. Mm -hmm. They just think that pastors don't want to go there. They just think that, oh, they, they just... And, but you're dealing with a different tension. And so I think that what we haven't been as effective in dealing with the conversation because in many ways we haven't totally understood how to get into the conversation. Now, some pastors do need to be kicked in the butt. Right, so I'm not, this isn't a cop out to say that churches don't need to move, all right? That's not what it is at all. But I am saying that, I, that as a younger pastor, I have a sense of having talked to older pastors, I have a general basic understanding because I'm fighting them on hats in church. No, really. I, I mean, I'm, have, I'm fighting them. Think about it. Think about it. For boomers, one of the big fights in the daggone church, if you remember, was the drums coming up in the church. Mm -hmm. That was an a electric, fight for drums to come up in the, the church. It, it used to be a fight on whether the <laughs> church choir could rock back and forth. It was a big fight on liturgical dance. I mean, those were huge church fights. And, you, and, you, and, and you think, you talk about oral sex and people going down <laughs> and giving head and, and all this kind of stuff. He's talking about giving head. He talking about, he, this man just talked about anal pap smears. You think you're going to talk about <laughs> anal pap smears? And these folks is fighting about whether it can be drums uh, in the church? They look sort of askance at me at Columbia when I started talking about anal pap smears, too. Well, but anyway, well, <laughs> Dr. Bambi, you, you have experience with pastors in South Carolina as part of um, Project Faith. Yeah. Yeah, our, our uh, agency was funded, uh, and and actually we won some of our funding back this year, but um, it was murdered in uh, 2010. But for a uh, six-year period, our agency was funded through the legislature, a uh, million-dollar appropriation for uh, oh, uh, six years or a million dollars a year for six years. Um, and what we uh, did during that six year period was engage uh, faith based communities providing education, technical assistance, capacity building for churches or faith based entities that had uh, health teams, uh, HIV ministry to build their capacity. Um, uh, I want to note first that uh, there is several published articles that if you're interested, if you give me your card, I'll, I'll send those to you. One of them had to do with uh, uh, our grantees. We funded, uh, directly funded about 42 churches over the course of the time. And uh, one of the requirements they had was to administer a KAB, or what we call Knowledge, Attitude, Belief uh, survey to their parishioners so that we could get a feel, because really at the core of this funding, it was a stigma elimination mm -hmm, mm -hmm. effort. We believe that in order to save soul, save lives, you ha and save uh, you have uh, save souls, you have to save their life. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, the 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 whole notion, first of all, the data clearly supported that people within the church are sexually active. Right. 
it well, supported the, the context that they have had STDs, STIs, uh, that they're, um, so they were not non-sexual people. Um, the, so, so that kind of laid a precedence for why we need to have this information in, the, in a faith-based setting. Um, uh, we uh, worked with uh, Reverend Sanders, Some many of you may know him, uh, from Nashville, uh, Tennessee, uh, and we, over a five-month period, worked with pastors and clergy from different denominations in an academy. Um, we, I, don't, I can't say that the, the faith-based leadership is totally averse. I think they're similar to physicians. How many, uh, this is, it's, only, it's new that the medical arena is starting to ask the hard questions. They have had clients come in with STIs time after time after time, treated them, but never got to the core of why they were there again. Why? Because in their training in medical school, they are not being prepared. They're getting the epi, they're getting all of the other physiological pieces, but they're not getting, how do you take a sex history? How do you move past the bull and get to the core of what this person really needs to talk about so that you not just treat it, but also treat the being, not just the disease? Well, same thing with, uh, we found in the, in the, in our church ministry work, if you want to call it that. We have a lot of uh, pastors who really understand and want to move forward. They are not being provided the technical assistance and the knowledge and the skills. Some of it they can't talk about. So what we looked for were people who had skill sets in the church, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the nurses, mm -hmm. The, the people who worked in the medical arena who were uh, coming onto these faith-based uh, ministries mm -hmm. and, and got, let them kind of do the work for the pastor, mm -hmm. he would or she would allow the sanction, but they didn't want to do the hard work. They didn't want to talk about anal pap smears and, and whatever. Uh, but um, so it's not just about the pastor, because quite frankly, we all know that the church is an industry. It is a business. You can't serve souls if you can't keep your doors open. And so they are concerned about ties. I mean, that's the backdrop of a lot of this, that a lot of their not, a lack of adoption has to do with their fear that they'll lose parishioners and they'll lose ties and they'll lose their grounding. So, Can I bring it down back to D.C. Duane? You yeah. talked about developing peer groups among the young people. How do you train young people to talk about this in a way that's not... Commercial. I mean, I guess I know in some ways, I mean, young people see sex all the time mm -hmm. and talk about sex all the time. But then when it comes to actually like engaging in safe sexual practices, that's a different kind of conversation. How do you, what is the language that you actually train them to speak? Well, the, the first thing we do is we, we talk about sexuality. Um, everything that's mainstream really is about sex. And our culture is a, is a sexual culture, but it's not a culture that talks about sexuality very often. Um, when folks start to talk about whether they're straight, gay, bi, trans, um, like it becomes a gray area for most of us. And folks are really afraid of, of how to go about that. So the first thing we do is we talk about where are you? Where do you stand? Um, what are your cultural norms? And then how can we move forward along that? Uh, when we talk about fighting HIV, it isn't a fight against sex. Uh, it's really a fight against perceived moral delinquency. Um, everybody has this idea of what, you know, what is culturally accepting uh, or what could be culturally accepted uh, when in reality, we do these things. We're having sex. Uh, we are sexual beings. And so the first thing we do is we break down all the walls and we say, look, we understand you're a sexual being. Where are we going to go from there? Uh, we, we definitely train everybody in uh, HIV 101, STI 101, uh, all the information that you would talk about uh, clinically. But then we also talk about behavior change, um, a, a bit about job skills and how to manage all these things uh, so that you can be a professional in this work as well. Uh, it can't just be a HIV 101. Mm -hmm. What do you find that they're most ignorant about? Whew. Um, funny enough, uh, most folks are really ignorant about 
uh, bacterial STIs. Um, again, folks know HIV. Folks know what your four fluids are and then your, your, your additional fluids. Um, folks know how to protect themselves. The real issue becomes, why aren't we? Um, it's not necessarily a knowledge issue anymore. It's a cultural issue in mm -hmm. my view. Um, a lot of folks aren't ignorant to the fact that uh, if you are engaging in a sexual, a risky sexual activity, you could get HIV. A lot of folks choose to go ahead and go with that risk. And I think it's because for many, sexual activity is that closest intimacy that they're going to have in their life. Um, a lot of our families aren't really sound. We're not really together anymore. Um, a lot of times folks don't feel connected to anything else. And so even in, in your sexual activity, they we're telling somebody to put a barrier there. And they're like, nah, I'm gonna stand up for something. And it's, it's, it's sad. Um, and in some ways, to fight HIV, we really have to start building our community again. Uh, and then come home back into our sexual activity. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a hand. Okay, I, can I just come, Dr. Uh, David, Dr. David, <laughs> Dr. Malcolm Branch down at the bottom. Why are, why do we, what do you, what is your opinion about why we say one thing and do something else? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I wouldn't want to put a pathological label on it, like say okay. it's because of mental health or people are depressed. I think that's kind of like a common scapegoat that we use. Mm -hmm. And not everybody that's having unprotected sex is like depressed or anxious or self-loathing or full of low self-esteem as we tend to like push on them. Um, I think the delicate balance that we have, a, we have trouble kind of navigating here is how to give people the proper tools to protect themselves, but then also say, enjoy the hell out of sex while you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And some people have been raised to think that like Bill Clinton had advertised back in the day that like oral sex is not real sex. So the real sex comes when you're screwing. So right. um, that's I just a I see a, a lot of heads shaking in the audience. Yeah, that's, just a, that's just a prelude to the main <laughs> course. So you don't have to really, like the oral sex, like Ugh, why am I doing oral sex? Because we gotta get to the penetration. That's where the real stuff happens. Mm -hmm. And what we have to do is start actually navigating people and teaching people there are other ways that you can experience orgasm and experience pleasure, and sex is actually a good thing, but then also protecting yourself, because I think it's a de delicate balance. And believe it or not, unprotected sex, the way it's phrased right now, is all kind of like in battle terms, mm -hmm. and in war terms, and these kind of things that we've been constantly using in the HIV arena, where it's just, why don't we just say it's natural sex? Sex isn't supposed to be with a condom. Sorry, but it's not supposed to be. And so. Training people, yeah, mind blowing, right? So, so how do you train, combat train, that? Training people to actually put something on mm -hmm. that not only decreases the intimacy, because you have to put this latex barrier or polyurethane or lambskin, whatever the hell you're gonna put on, that's gonna come between you and this person that you're close with um, and you're trying to connect with, but then also um, it's not gonna feel good for the guys. Mm -hmm. And so they're gonna be like, well, I can't get hard anymore or I can't, come so you know what am I supposed to do and so until we want to talk about that and we're talking about we can't talk about they, you know in churches they can't talk about hats I mean so you know they're getting <laughs> in arguments about hats between generations so you can't expect people to actually talk about sex period I used to want to do work when I was um training in New York City and I remember I met with Pernessa Seal and I was like, you know, I want to do some work with some of the churches over here and do some research and find out, you know, how people's opinions are about sexuality, homosexuality. And she said, you know, sweetie, slow your roll. Like, we got to get people to talk about sex, period, and sexuality, period, before we actually leapfrog into homosexuality. That's going to be a little bit of a big jump for them. Um, so I think it's, it's challenging to actually do that. And I think that's what we're charged with right now is that people are enjoying sex and you want to give a sex positive message, but then couple that with how do I protect myself? What I typically do and I think something that Dwayne said is absolutely right it's all about judgment and so people are afraid to admit what they do because they're afraid that whoever it is the pastor the doctor uh, the peer navigator whoever it is the parents is going to be judging them on that and they just want to be honest about what they did so if we didn't get so much caught up in the judgment of it and say, you know what, it's okay, but I want you to protect yourself like people would say to me like doc I had unprotected sex I know you're going to kill me and I was like I have unprotected sex. And they're like, oh my God, you do, you're a doctor. And I said, yeah, but you need to know, what I teach is not, you have to use condoms or else you're gonna burn in hell, or you have to have condoms or else you're gonna get an STD. I teach them, these are the behaviors, 
these are the STIs you can get. The big daddy is HIV. The other ones you can get through oral sex, the other ones you can get this. So as long as I equip you with the knowledge, you need to know going in what your risk is and you need to decide for yourself if you're comfortable with that level of risk or if you're not. Because you can't blame anyone but yourself at the end of the day and say, you know what, I am gonna have sex without a condom. I'm gonna have anal sex without a condom and let somebody penetrate me and have an orgasm inside of me. Oh, you're gonna do that? Well, that's actually the most risky behavior for HIV. So if you're willing to take that risk, then you have to know that. But if people don't have that education, those layers, instead it's just like, strap it up, put a condom on, you know, do this, mm -hmm. do that. And it's, it's so black and white, but there are nuances to it that people are dying to talk about. Mm -hmm. But our teachers, our physicians, our nurse practitioners, our nurses, our physician assistants, our pastors, our parents, we're all not discussing it because we're uncomfortable with it. Because mm -hmm. we don't want to have kids looking at us and saying, well, you're doing the same damn thing. Why are you telling me that I can't, you know, mm -hmm. this is that and the other. So it becomes very, very tricky, especially for, you know, boomers, Generation X, and we're seeing these kids coming up in like their 19 and mm -hmm. 20s, and they're really having a, a hard time. And they're looking to us, and we're like not practicing what we preach, and we're acting more uncomfortable than they are. And so that's a, that's a hard act to follow. So I think until we can find some concrete solutions to figure out how to give sex positive messages like Bambi was saying, but give people the knowledge to protect themselves and know what the risks are, then it's gonna be really dicey. Okay, um, was there a question out here? I'm sorry, is that, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Dr. Malbrick said uh, a lot of the things that I wanna say because um, I really think, especially in a, in a new context, I think that first we have to be clear that um, from a sense of, of uh, HIV STD prevention, that our interventions are not reaching young people under the age of 18. Right. Because of the governmental red tape that's involved in dealing with the minors. And so young people are not even getting this, this public health condom message. Um, but what we, what we do know is that young people are having, and I don't like to say unprotected sex, but I'll say it in the context. Yes, of they are. Uh, young people are having unprotected sex, not because of all the different things that that um, I mean, I'm as far as low self esteem, but they, they just they just want to. <laughs> well, there's. So, and so, okay, so, the, so, and so the, the the frame of that, I say that all to say, how do we have conversations now that are not just the static? Put on the condom, don't get HIV, or don't get pregnant. That was actually the. Well, where that, I was that ready to but go. that is, in in my opinion, that is why we have to start with where do we get our information from? Where should it begin? Theoretically, it should begin at home. And so I worked for the Department of Education for seven years as a health consultant. The, it, and I don't know how it is in D.C., but I do know that in South Carolina and many southern states, the, the, the name of the game is censorship. And so you're talking about a young person who enters in a K, K and all through their 12th grade year is, is exposed to little or nothing of really uh, a credible, viable information. It's not behavior based. It's plumbing based. It's it's technical information based, but they never get to the core question. So if they have a if they get some basic knowledge in the classroom, which many parents don't even know what they're getting, which is part of our responsibility to know what is it exactly show me your curriculum. Show me what you're talking about. Show me what you're not talking about. And ask the kinds of questions like, why aren't you talking about condoms? Why are you not? And that's our responsibility. So they don't get it at, they don't get it at school, which is where they spend most of their time. Then we're not talking about it at home. So where, pray tell, should they get it? Then they don't, if, unless they're at a, 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 a spiritual setting that's nurturing like this, uh, like uh, Pastor um, Tony here, where do they get it? So we're asking them to act and to be something that they've never talked about. Um, the only, the main thing that we're trying to focus on now, as far as MSM, uh, I remember vividly going to counseling at the high schools, knowing that they had a large contingent of young gay men. How did I know? Because they would show up in our office and you say, well, what grade are you in? Well, I'm in high school or I'm in, a, in, in early, just started college. So their, their networks will send them to the places where you get tested, but there's no avenue for us to go into their venue. Counseling won't touch it. 
the principals won't touch it. School is not an option. I'm just going to tell you. That's not an option. So our challenge is finding out where are, are the other options because the average school is not going to address young men that have sex with men. Our law says in South Carolina, you are not permitted by law to speak of any uh, sexual orientation other than heterosexualism within the context of marriage. So there's not a teacher in South Carolina that will engage in that conversation. And just by way of sort of where that leads you, South Carolina leads the nation in heterosexual transmission of HIV, so that's working real well for them. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I can say that because I'm not taking money from the state. Um, I wanted to get to some like actual language we could use. Actually, before we get to actual language, um, is there, are there gender specific phrases, words, approaches to this among MSMs WMs, and I get confused with all these things, men who have sex with men, young girls versus young men, heterosexual, whether they're heterosexual or not. Um, how, what are the different ways, what language can we actually use? I want to give people a sense of some actual phrases that they can go home with and say, you know, if they're talking to their grandchildren, their children, their pastors, whomever, well, how can we approach it? We got something from um, from Reverend Lee about the, the, the liturgical and the theological approaches to this. Can I go down the line, starting with you, Dwayne? Sure. Yeah. Um, I honestly just want to see more heterose heterosexual men involved in HIV prevention, period. Hmm. Um, I don't even know if there is a phrase to make that happen magically, right. but <laughs> we have to step up at some point. Um, there, there's so many issues that are not being involved in the fight as much leads and causes. So I, I honestly don't have a, a straight up answer to this is the phrase that you say. Um, just, just whatever you do, just try to have an honest conversation. Uh, that's, that's the only thing I can say toward that. Mm -hmm. Mine is simply talk, get to the point. Stop beating around the bush. S call it what it is, say what it is, stand by what you say. Um, I know I have a 15-year-old grandson. I talk to him straight up, period. I let him know. I, he, when, he, when I talk to him, he feels like I'm assuming he's d doing it. It's not that I'm assuming he's doing it. It's that I've dealt with enough young people to know that the probability that he hasn't yet is very unlikely. So it's not about if and when, it's about, it's not about if you might. It's like, I, I, you got condoms all around you, son. Mm -hmm. You got them at my office, you see them in my house. You can go to any, anyone and get a condom. The condom is free. The pregnancy is $279,000 from birth to 17. Which one would you like to pay? Free or two hundred seventy nine thousand. What does that mean? There's a personal accountability. You have the right to protect yourself and to protect the person you're with. If you choose not to do that, then you can look at two hundred seventy nine thousand dollars and be clear. There won't be a place you can hide that we won't send the man for you. We will give him your social <laughs> security number. We will not protect you from your responsibility. And so I, I'm just going to get to the point. Mm -hmm. um, you want to add anything? I, don't, I think what my brother said about it's hard to come after Bambi, right? I mean, she was, <laughs> we will not protect you. You will not be hidden. <laughs> I hope he never become a gangster either. <laughs> uh, just like Judge Mathis. God he almighty. Did it. We love you, but we will tell. <laughs> but no, um, the brother said just about honest conversation, just about the need to just be honest um, about what's happening. Um, just honesty um, would be, the, be my phrasing. Yeah, I, I would say the same thing. I mean, as a clinician, it's different for me because I, I kind of like 
not really have a script, but there's no phrases that I use per se. And I, you know, there's not going to be a handout like, here's what young MSM say, here's what young black MSM say, you know, <laughs> yo, homie, you know, it's not going to be like that. So, you know, there, for me, it's it's about springboarding off what Reverend Tony's saying. It's like doing the, um, just being honest about stuff. So right. some people don't like the question like, are you sexually active or are you having sex? Um, but I actually think it's a good lead in because, it, I mean, from a clinical perspective, sometimes I say, I'm about to get into your business. Like, right now, I'm, I'm, I'm really about to go in, but it helps me as a provider, like being able to figure out what's going on with you. And then I'll ask them if they're having sex, and I'll be like, well, with who? And it's funny, because like when I was at Grady Hospital with it, in Atlanta, when I would ask like guys, I'd say, are you having sex with men, women, or both, or women, men, or both? And I always try to start off with women, because then it makes it, it's easier for them to digest. I say, so women, men, or both? And they'll be like, oh man, dog, no, it's just women, it's just women. These kids at Penn, it doesn't matter the race, it doesn't matter the age from 18 to 26, 30, they roll with it. And they're just like this, they're like, oh, just women. Oh, just men. Oh, actually, I have sex with both. And then they just move on. And it's like literally next question. So it's like a huge generational divide that I'm noticing where I ask the question and I think it all depends is on the... Is it generational or is it geographical? Well, I think it can, I think it's both. I think it's intersectional. So it's generational and geographical. And so what I think happens is that it reflects the comfort that you have with it. And I, I, I create this analogy because if you make it as nonchalant as if I'm asking you to pass the salt at the dinner table that you're gonna ask a question about sex, then the other person that's receiving that question is not gonna nut up and get all nervous. It's like when somebody says, um, and I tell people this all the time because I make the analogy, I think Kelly's smiling because he knows what I'm gonna say, but like, I think as, as homosexual men, we kind of nut up sometimes when people say, well, do you have a girlfriend? And somebody who doesn't know that we are same gender attracted, they'll say, oh, you know, do you have a girlfriend? And we'll be like, uh, uh, uh. And then we nut up, and they're, the, they're like, what the hell is wrong with you? Like, why are you nutting up on this? It's just a simple question. But if we say, yeah, man, I got this brother I've been dating for about three months. He's all right, I may take him to Mexico next week or something, we'll see if it gets that serious. Could you pass the greens? And then you just kind of move on. It's the same nonchalance that a straight person would say, oh yeah, uh, we're going to, you know, we're gonna take a vacation, we're gonna take the kids, da 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 da, because that's normal. So what we're talking about here is normalizing the conversation no matter what your sexuality is, who you have sex with, what the behavior is, just make it kind of a positive thing and people will respond. I don't think there's a specific phrase, but the context has to be more of an affirming one so that people don't think that what I'm doing, if I do something that's different from a heterosexual norm, I'm gonna be slammed about this. That's what kids are afraid of. That's hell, that's what adults are afraid of. I know guys in their 50s and 60s that are afraid because they still think they're gonna get slammed and they act in like 16 year old kids. And I know 17 year olds that are more comfortable with their sexuality than they are. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's about who's approaching and kind of how you approach it, not so much the phrasing. I, well, I would say get prepared also. Um, we, we don't prepare. We have children or we have nephews or nieces or people that are close to us, but we don't prepare ourselves. You know, I try to tell parents, uh, um, let me give you some what ifs. And in that, net, what if, then I can get an idea of what their prepar level of preparation is. There is no preparation when your kid walks in one day from school and you know, you're know you washing dishes and minding your own business and they ask you, what's oral, what's oral sex now? <laughs> that happened to me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I try to do per a right. personal reflection. Or when you're standing in Nordstrom's in Washington, D.C., and your phone rings and you're about to transact business with a woman at the table, and your phone rings and you say, hello, and you say, Grandma, when you get home, we really need to talk right. about mm. my penis is not growing. Mm. Could you excuse me for a minute? <laughs> now, um, and the conversation in Nordstrom's at that moment, I could have tabled it. We can table it. We can keep tabling it and tabling it, mm. acting like we're going to go back to it, but you never quite go back to it. Right. You know, so there's an immediate response that we need to prepare for, which is, I'm in the store, which is, uh, tell me about why you're worrying about your penis growing. Oh, well, the boy said... The boy said it's little. Now, if that was you and that was me, you, uh, my, qu my question was, what do they know about it? Right. <laughs> right. And his response was very 
normal. He said, well, when I was peeing, they were standing on the toilet looking over the, over the yes. stall, and they said I was little. I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, first of all, you'll get what you need when God's ready to give it to you. It's, you'll have more than enough that you can worry about. Okay? That's the showers and growers conversation. Yeah, I said, but in the meantime, I'm standing in Nordstrom's right now. So I promise you when I get home, I have a book for you, which is my last commentary. Get some books. You have a Bible, you have all this stuff in your house. If you go into Google and you type in uh, sexuality books for children, sexuality books for teens, it'll bring you up all kinds of suggestions. Where Did I Come From by Peter Mayer, which is a great cartoon book. That's when I realized my daughter didn't know what doing it was. After she read it, she said, ew, that's nasty. <laughs> now, she had already told me about the kids at school were doing this. I just assumed she knew what doing this was. Wrong answer. Don't assume. I'd like to come. There was, I'm sorry, go ahead, Joy. I actually want to follow that up. Um, two things. That is a very real situation because uh, there are many men, like, I heard somebody gasp, like, <gasps> like, no, that happens, like, as a kid, like, Folks will be standing over trying to see what you're working with. Right. Um, the uh, yeah, <laughs> she's like, that's not a girl thing. Not yeah, right. um, yeah, it's but little boys I they girls do yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, it's, yeah, so it's a whole different scenario <laughs> there. Um, but then I, I am a living example of a parent who had the wherewithal to say, okay, I don't know it, and I'm going to refer you to this other organization. Um, I was in fourth grade. And there was a group who came to my school, and they, you know, sent home this form. I didn't get to read the form, really. Gave it to my mom. She's like, okay, it's that time. Signed off on the form, and let me go to the class. And the class covered good touch, bad touch. And uh, they talked about this thing called HIV that's going to be a really big deal. Uh, and they really think that it's going to affect D.C. Um, and then... Lo and behold, uh, at 14, uh, I'm then starting to do HIV prevention work 10 years later. So, well, no, that's not, the math is wrong there. Anyway, at 14, uh, I started to do that, yeah. You know. How did they know that DC was, it was gonna be a big deal in DC? There, there was a, there, I don't even know that organization. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, it could have been MTA, yeah. I don't know. But, um, but they, were, they were talking about DC uh, probably because of incarceration rates at the time mm -hmm. and how uh, it, was, it was being spread mm -hmm. in, the, in the time period. How big an issue is incarceration? <laughs> yeah, um, folks aren't getting adequate health uh, healthcare in, uh, in facilities and then if we are incarcerating folk who are HIV positive uh, just for living, um, and and we, we are, we've had that conversation, or I guess we're about to get into the conversation of uh, criminal, the criminalization. HIV, the criminalization of HIV. Um, if we're... Can you uh, define what that, does anybody here know what that means when we talk about criminalization of HIV? Can you just define what you're talking about? Uh, so uh, folks who are HIV positive are uh, being arrested or having charges brought against them because they are, uh, they, it's perceived that they're not uh, disclosing uh, their status, and so when we're when we're arresting folks for living their lives, um, and there's a fear that you're going to spread HIV. Um, if you if you put somebody in jail, they're not getting adequate services. They're not getting treatment, uh, and that's going to increase the risk of HIV being spread within the jail system. Along with the fact that nobody wants to talk about what they do in jail when they get out of jail. Yeah. Well, there's two kind. I mean, you. Uh, it depends on whether you're talking about systems of correction mm -hmm. or whether you're talking about detention centers. Yeah. Okay. You know, and it, it's very state specific. And what difference there are states does it make? that have very effective programs of treatment in their detention centers mm -hmm. as well as in their systems of correction. Uh, so many times, the detention centers are like county versus when you go to what we define as prison, which is a state entity. South Carolina, for example, was the last state to get, on, uh, get off the list, if you will, with the Justice Department for segregating their inmates by HIV status. It is this year that they finally conceded after I think Alabama was the previous uh, um, uh, state, but to say this, but but in a, from an innovation perspective, 
um, th what we're being told, because, you know, obviously there's, a quest there's questions that now evolve. We know prisoners, uh, inmates have sexual relations. The question is how they test them in South Carolina when they come in, but they don't test them when they leave currently. So that is part of the policy conversation that has to occur. How do we either create a policy or uh, get the Department of Corrections to institutionalize the policy of testing on the way out? They have already made it clear condoms will not be distributed. So what they're doing to try to counteract, I think, is as innovative as they can get, which is to uh, ensure that inmates that are positive get the best or highest quality of treatment that they can afford to make sure that their viral load stays as low as possible to decrease the chances that they'll transmit the virus to another individual even if they are engaging in sexual intercourse. Some may say you should do more, but right now the medical treatment is going to be the only way that we're going to contain it. The other thing that we're not, sort of gets left off the table here, and it became clear to me as I was working on this film, is that there are a lot of um, women, young women, um, infected, living with HIV now, who were sexually abused as younger girls. And when we have this conversation around safe sex, the conversation very often is put on, the onus is put on the receiving partner to to force the other partner to put on the condom. But if you've been victimized, whether you're male or female, um, as a young person, your ability to negotiate anything around sex is incredibly diminished. How do we engage and how do, you, how do all of you engage um, the conversation of empowering people to even begin the negotiation that needs to happen here. Because we're all, you know, I mean, we all sort of act like, oh, well, we're all strong people, we're gonna go forth in the world and demand that they have safe sex. But if you're a 17-year-old girl and you're dealing with a 32-year-old guy, or if you're you know, a 15-year-old guy and you've been thrown out on the street because you told your parents you're gay and you're in a situation where you have to exchange sexual favors in, a, in exchange for a place to live or food to eat, what, you don't have any power to negotiate safe sex in that situation. How do you, how would you all deal with that? From a, either from a policy level or for just from a heart-to-heart -heart level? Well, as a practitioner, um, I, I assume that a young woman has been sexually assaulted. I don't ask her questions like, have you ever been? I say, I ask her, at what age were you ever forced to have sex without your permission? That's a whole nother question. Uh, that it's like asking people about their drug use. I, don't, I assume people smoked marijuana or they're smoking marijuana. The question is not, have you ever smoked it? The question is, uh, at what age did you begin smoking marijuana? And do you, you know, and are you currently, you, your current use is, how would you define your current use? So I think that if we don't ask that question, if we don't make that assumption, then what most people do because of the dissonance it creates in them, especially even males um, that have been sexually assaulted, um, their first reaction is to give you the response they think you're comfortable with. And that is to say, I've never, it's never happened to me. So posing the, asking the question is, is vital because if the answer is yes, and the younger the age in which they share that with you, that then that'll allow you some space to then talk further with them about um, um, the frequency of it, the duration of it, and the impact it's having on them now, whether they ever had counseling for it, do they want counseling for it, because that's a bridge to talk about whatever the relationship they're in right now. Reverend Lee? How do you deal with that in your at Community of Hope Church? So interestingly, um, a lot of what we've learned to do, honestly, is to shape great partnerships with people who know what they're doing. Um, because it's hard to think that... So there, there are a couple of challenges for a church. One, churches are often expected to do what the organizations, health department, etc., aren't even doing. 
um, so a health department in our area, you know, so you've got health departments that are in crisis or broken and aren't even doing the stuff right around HIV and AIDS. Right, and it's a good example. The health department um, has these meetings around, community meetings around HIV and AIDS, um, and what they want the community to come to, but they're at two o'clock on a Thursday. That's a yeah, good way to make sure no, nobody no, comes. No, no, no. <laughs> It's at 2 o'clock on a Thursday, and Where we're sitting this? in the meeting. I'm not going to say because it's my health department, <laughs> <laughs> and I can't say it for the record. Amen. But just remind me to tell you where I live. <laughs> um, no, 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 and we're sitting in a meeting, and the health department is saying this, and I'm like, well, why are y'all having a... And so as a church, we're trying to help them to do that stuff. But the challenge is, as a pastor, honestly, this is not my field. This is not necessarily, this may be some of my members' field, but this is, so I, I did not go to seminary for this. Right. You see what I'm saying? Right. And so it would be very arrogant of me to think that everything that you all are doing, I'm doing. Because it's just not it. But I partner with, say, the Community Education Group. I partner with other organizations that are able to come in and assist us with certain things mm -hmm. so that when we're doing testing, we're not doing testing. But we're connecting the organizations that can plug them into wraparound services, and, and they can do all those things instead of us doing those things. And so, and so, so I don't really have a great answer for that um, because you make I, I, I make, you referrals just make referrals like a yeah. big dog. Referral is my great friend. <laughs> all right, but I make referrals not just around sex and sex stuff, not just around HIV and AIDS stuff. Mm -hmm. That's around a mental health stuff. A lot, a lot of pieces, stuff. Mm -hmm. drug stuff. You know. Mm -hmm. I, I can't think that our church is going to be able to do everything about everything. Right. What I can say is this area, we need to have some competence and some capacity, but I, we need to have a great referral list and a great team of organizations that when it comes to that stuff, then we're able to refer it out and my people know who to make the referrals to. And, and so with that, and I can't really say that I'm dealing with that at that level, right. um, but I'm making a lot of referrals. All right. So. Well, that's wise to know. Okay. There's a I question. would just add, um, good afternoon. To um, your point, um, Sister Cross, it's not just those who've been abused. Nine times out of ten, and I, I'm not citing any statistics that I know, but I just know as a black woman, and I, I don't stand here, you know, so to speak. But the point is, the first experience that a woman has tends to be with the older guy. So mm -hmm. she already is powerless. I like the dynamic that you were bringing to that discussion, but it, she doesn't have to have been molested. She could have consented mm -hmm. to have had in sex, but it's usually with an older guy. And the emotions and all those other things that come with it, Mm -hmm. is it's mind-blowing in the sense that it's not what we thought it should have been and so from 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 the from the uh, expression of even being able to express what you want that doesn't come until she's more mature <laughs> it really doesn't um, it takes some practice and then she knows how to speak up for herself and speak mm -hmm. for what she would like to have happen versus <laughs> what has happened but um so I thought that was interesting, and, and even if uh, um, uh, Reverend Lee can't speak on that, I think that is just an overall notion and discussion that we don't tend to have. I think we just say two people had sex and they knew what was going on, not really. Um, but to um, Reverend Lee's point, um, what I'd like to say, and I wake up to you uh, most 7.30 when I'm on my way to church. Um, God thinking. bless you. Thank you. God bless you. It's, 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 she's I listening to Sunday so Morning Hope on WPGC 95.5. You, you, so <laughs> you got a great radio voice there. <laughs> thank you so much when you turn it up to a, you know, a little bit more Kirk Franklin versus some of that, uh, you know, but, but that's because I just needed to get pumped up before I'm going early in the morning. But my point to you is, Interestingly enough, because I'm very active in the church and I know that most churches are moving towards that of referral because they may not have the inside resources to do it, but I just still find that it's a few coveted people that know that there's a referral basis going on. It would be maybe your deacons or the upper echelon, so to speak, in terms of the church, that would actually know versus the community at large that are still trying to feel their way, is this a church I even want to attend and join? They, they, may, they, they, they like some of the things in the programs that are going on, but they have a particular need, per se, and this is something as simple as a job, okay? 
to say that you know and have some referrals for maybe the next job fair or whatever, whatever, that doesn't really get conveyed in the scripture and the sermon throughout the Sunday. So it, 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 can you share how best to kind of promote that so that not to say that that's the... You say, I'm sorry, what's the that in the... I'm trying to understand. Promote the... Oh, 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 promote the referrals that they have clear. the okay. access to All right. referrals. Mm -hmm. um, All right. We're running out of time, so let's let him so, answer the no, question. No, that's a great question. What what we've been able to do, and I'm not saying that we have it all down because we're only seven years old, um, but we have what we have been able to do is a couple of pieces. Um, one, um, the whole ministerial staff has access to referrals. Two, we have an outreach ministry, and so our outreach ministry um, is able to handle those kinds of pieces. But three, we actually have um, an area, um, and we see a couple of things. One, we have an area in which there's all the kind of um, um, STI information, HIV information, you know, all the little pamphlets and that kind of stuff. There's an area there, but there's also an area in which there's in which there's information about some of the things you're talking about. Um, and so, you know, access to kind of job fairs, etc. We also though have a partnership with our um, um, not Department of Health with our Department of Family Services. And so our Department of Family Services actually has a community hub with us twice a month in which you can come to our church and all of the, um, anything you can get at the Department of Family Services, um, they've got a laptop right there. It's one of their people working it and they can do everything there. But what we did on top of that was we had most of the folks in our outreach ministry trained so that on Sunday or any other time that our outreach ministers, while they don't have the laptop, um, they can be able to do those kinds of referrals straight to somebody at the Department of Family Services. So they can sit and they can walk a person through kind of the basic stuff and then the, it's, a, it's like a warm contact in family services instead of you going to family services and have to kind of just walking in cold um, that is coming from us to who the person we know in family services and we're able to kind of move that process along and help it along. And that can be around housing, that can be around job stuff, that can be around um, food stuff, you know, a range of things that you would come in need of. Um, this is a legislative weekend, and I just need to, we've I mean, been talking a lot about individual responsibility and what the church can do and what individual organizations can do, but what is the role that governments, either local or state or federal, can take, should be taking? Now, Dr. Malabranch, from your point of view, what would you say? I defer to Kali Lindsay. Oh. <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I think there's a lot of policy things that um, folks can do, and I think the, the probably the most glaring one is kind of making it more consistent across the board with the uh, correctional facilities. Um, because I know in Georgia there was a large study years ago that actually examined uh, inmates that had gone through the prison system through about eight years, and they found that the it was actually a very small percentage, like less than 2% actually contracted HIV in prison. They, the vast majority of the people who were HIV positive had it before they got into they got prison. In. So instead of having that conversation like, oh my God, they're going to go to prison, then they're going to get HIV and come back and infect us, right. mm -hmm. um, it was kind of like, well, wait a minute, they're part of our community before they go in there. And then when they go in there, it may become kind of more of a Petri dish, so to speak, where if you're not giving condoms and stuff, these things can happen. So I think making it consistent around the board as far as like testing when you get in and when you leave, and I know it's gonna be a harder nut to crack as far as condom use, but I think that kind of policy. And then of course all the criminalization around drugs, like keeping people out, because I think it, it doesn't start with HIV, it starts with kind of like this disproportionate sentencing that you know Obama I think dropped down, I think it was from 100 to one to 18 to one, something like that, but it should be equal for powder cocaine and crack cocaine. Um, um, but we just haven't gotten to that. It's almost like with the Affordable Care Act, he's trying to move us towards universal health care. He's trying to move it for, but there are a lot of people that don't want crack cocaine and powder cocaine to have the same sentencing. So I think on those levels, some of the more systemic things that start before HIV, but keep a lot of black men locked up are some of the things we need to work on. Um, I, I want to talk about more community engagement. Um, I, uh, our agency has recently been going around the state doing sessions on ACA, just trying to talk to communities about this upcoming date and what it means. 
Um, and I was, I won't say where, but I was in a community with the NAACP. It was a chapter of the NAACP, and I have another one pending. And so during, uh, at the end of the session, I asked three questions. Uh, the group was made up of predominantly voters, predominantly um, middle-aged to boomers, people who had a clear history of understanding the need for civil rights, and the whole nine. At the end, I asked them three questions. I said, I'd like you to stand up if, and we could try it here, matter of fact, stand up if you know the name of the person in your district, when you go, wherever you live in your district, the person who represents you in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. You know their name, stand up. Yeah. Okay. Um, second question. Do you, uh uh uh, no, 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 no. You stand up. <laughs> Second question. Do you know them well enough? Do you have their phone number? Can you call them? Do you, do you know them well enough where when they see you, they recognize you? If that's the case, stay, stay up. If you, if you don't, if they wouldn't know you from Adam's Tomcat, then have a seat. <laughs> Last question. Have they done anything for you? Have they gotten you anything? Did they get you some money? Did they change a policy or a regulation in your community or do anything of significance that would create that relationship between the two of you? If for those of you that are standing, you have a relationship. But for too many of us, we have no relationship. We don't know the names of the people that represent us, but we tell people to go vote. Then who are you voting for? if you don't know their name. They are in that state house making policies and decisions around our lives and our children's lives and we are clueless until it happens. And then we say, well, how did it happen? It happened because we didn't pick up the phone and say, I'm from your district. My name is such and such. I'd like to, to make an appointment with you. We get caught up in color. They're a white Republican, and we know that they are not supportive of our issues, but we still don't present ourselves in their face and say, I'm still in your district, and I still need you to know where I sit on this particular issue. And so, my, so to the, your question, um, I'm quite weary of going to the State House and seeing other folks there who are making their issues known but yet we come to this meeting, we come into this Congressional Black Caucus meeting, we move and we shake, we dress and we party, but we go back home and don't know the name of the people that make decisions about our lives. We should be training our children to know it, we should be taking them to the State House and let them sit and watch the fiasco that goes on. <laughs> so that they can get a clue as to why they need to vote and why it's critical that we stop letting other people make decisions for our children, whether it's comprehensive school health, right. where they're framing policies that we know are not advantageous to our children, all the way down to city and county council, where they make decisions and we don't even know what they're doing either. So we just need to take some of this energy that's in this forum and we need to take it back and get active with it. And I think that, um, in speaking to what you're speaking about, and it's also significant that we're able to follow the money. Mm -hmm. um, and we're able to get the money. Um, I'll never forget, I, um, I, I was in a meeting, um, our state senator brought me into this meeting. He saw the work we were doing on HIV and AIDS, and he pulled together this meeting of the top folks around HIV in the state, and, and then also our local folks, et cetera, et cetera. And we sat in that meeting, but what we realized by the end, what I realized by the end of the meeting was, this is nice, this is cute, but ain't none of y'all got no money. Um, and when it comes to how the money is getting, and especially in the money that the state is able to get to my, the county I'm in, and when, I mean, when I sat and I looked at and actually talked to the health department in our county and their budget around HIV, I realized that their budget, like church budgets, I mean small church budgets were bigger than their budget on how to deal with HIV and AIDS in our community. And I, I'm looking at them like, 
why am I here with you? You ain't got no money, Dad. Go on. <laughs> um, and that's why you're not even able to be as effective as I think you should be, because really, and so I had them in there crying poor to me. It was like, I'm coming to see, you know, how we can tap into some money, and they asking me for money. It's data. And, and I'm sitting there like, good, God, am I, and so we've got to be able to utilize our, our political influence and relationship. We have to also develop to a to relationship something. with someone who has power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. who can, I mean, the fact that we got that appropriation for Project Faith for six years, I can, even today, I have colleagues who are livid, just absolutely undone, that an African-American-led agency was able to acquire that appropriation to, to forget the magnitude of the work, forget the magnitude of what was created and the fruits of our labor. They're just livid to the appropriation that was made to an African-American organization. What does that mean? But that, that didn't happen overnight. It was a dec over a decade of work that led to that appropriation. It was the collection of data that could not be overlooked, that came from community, epi data that we were able to validate that we have concerns here that must be addressed. And finding the champion who would go in and fight and make that deal. There are deals that are made. You want this, then you give me that. That's the deal. I'm not present at the deal, but I know the deal's getting done. I don't even need you to tell me how you did the deal. I just need you to know that I will bring the information that you need to leverage the conversation with people who I know don't care about AIDS. They don't care about AIDS. We have legislators who've said to our champion, Psh, don't matter to me, that's just one less of them dying. I mean, hey, that's one less I got to worry about paying some taxpayer dollars for. So part of it is not just having your, your homework done, but the other is your message. And the message that we, we use for to convey this leverage of political conversation has to do with money. Pay now or pay later. You can withhold the money here, but when these folks come up in your emergency room, at a 10-day stay, and cost you 60000 plus just for one individual, you multiply that time the number of admissions for outpatient or inpatient care, then you talk to me about why it, it is cheaper, clearly cheaper, to make sure people get their medication and get it on time, and to make sure that you put something into prevention. Dwayne, from a legislative point of view? Uh, more along the lines of uh, funding and following the, the stream of funding, we need school-based, uh, not even just school-based programming uh, fully uh, implemented, but we need outside of school-based uh, programming fully funded across the country. It needs to be a nationwide plan. Um, just because right now the schools aren't able to do it, Right now, the parents aren't able to do it, and so there needs to be somebody in that gap that's filling all the holes. And organizations are struggling, closing weekly, uh, because there's a lack of funding. And so I think that's, that's what we need in the immediate uh, time until we're able to get some of these parents and get the schools ready. Okay, other questions out here from anybody? Comments, questions? Are we all done? Anybody got any closing thoughts they want to make? I just Talk want to thank out. them for sticking with us. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. <laughs> this is recorded, so this isn't the last time we're going to see this panel. We uh -huh. will replay it over and over again uh, online on our website. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists. Please give them one more round of applause. And audience. Also wanted to mention... Um, uh, Dr. Tony Lewis, who is here, she works with the SCIU, and she has been going around the country uh, uh, training. You mentioned NAACP. I know she's also been doing stuff with the NAACP and doing trainings around the Affordable Care Act and how to enroll people. I mean, she she gets in there and she got the computers open, walking them through. Look, Bambi needs to meet you. She's right there. There she go. <laughs> she's in there, she's South Carolina. Um, and I want to also thank the CDC. Um, that is here, Francisco Ruiz and uh, Keisha Simmons. Yay. 
And um, so I want to thank them for also joining us and of course all my friends who are in the audience, all my friends who came. Um, <laughs> and I just want to thank you again for this important conversation and please look out. I will be editing and slicing these on YouTube. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Oh, and don't forget to fill out the surveys. Thanks. They're on your table.